Hello and welcome once again to Crazy Comics and Stories. It's me, your charming and delightful and full of Taco Bell, old Uncle Rat Bastard. And at the other end of the series of tubes and wires that we call the internets is Joe, crazy writer. How you doing today, Joe? I'll just say goodbye to everybody. My daughter had to have, uh, something's going on at their house. And uh, so she needed somewhere to put their cat while, you know, they come over, whoever's coming over to uh, take a look at, you know, what, why their house is vibrating. You know, can be a bad thing. I mean, normally for like you and me, it means one of our omnibuses is missing and the load bearing one is probably what did it. But or I'm doing laundry. Yeah, no, there's nothing like that. There was no no uh, nothing in the air, nothing in the plumbing. It was just one of those things that uh, wasn't quite sure what to do. So so we had to put our bunny in the in the cage, make sure it was OK. And now the cat is sitting on top of the cage going soon. You will. Be. No, actually, it was an older cat. Didn't really care. It uh, is pretty nonplus. I mean, didn't a little wary of of me, but you know, wandered That's around the house, wandered around the house like it owned it. So, well, have you so, recovered? Anyways, that was my daughter coming to pick up the cat, just to uh. let me know. So when I go finish the podcast and I can't find the cat, and I'm like, ah, that darn cat. So have we been bought by Disney yet? No. Okay, no more Disney references, I guess. Well, and uh, you know when. I had a joke uh, back when uh, Disney was doing Touchstone Films, which was their R-rated films. I said, mm-hmm. well, you know, Disney's doing R-rated films now, so they're going to be doing a remake of That Darn Cat, and it will be called That Fucking Cat. Please clap. Ah, uh, good enough. Jeb Bush liked it. Yeah, well, yeah, it's not much left around for him to like. Well, yeah, have you recovered from last week's show, Joe? Uh, well, you know, between, uh, uh, the, uh, my tongue suing me for divorce and my, uh, all the pizza we ate, we, we had a lot of stuff going on in, in a couple weeks here. And, uh, by the way, this is episode 402 and you know, I like to look up online how many episodes that we, we have compared to TV shows. You know what episode 403 will tie us with? Uh, uh no. The joy of painting. Oh, the joy. We all love joy. Well, that's the thing. I didn't know anything about the joy of painting till a few years ago when uh, Bob Ross became kind of everybody's hero online. He was actually a good way to fall asleep, too. He had such a reassuring, calming voice. <sighs> I, I shouldn't talk even about that. <laughs> I shouldn't talk about the kind of stuff I used to fall asleep to, should I? Uh, no, 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 uh, yeah, no. So I thought for episode 402, since uh, next week we'll be doing previews, right? Uh, I don't know. I have yet to hear from uh, Discount Comic Book Service if I will get my previews in time for next week's show. Oh, because I got my previews last week. Yeah, but you get yours every other week i get mine once a month and apparently because the month you know we're we're uh you know recording this right as april starts uh, apparently they've decided they haven't shipped it yet because i I went and i looked online and usually they've you know when previous comes out they have it shipped the following monday yeah they haven't shipped anything yet maybe you you made them angry hey yeah, they're going to make me angry. They're not that far away. I'll drive down there and fucking torch the place. They don't give me my comics. I paid for my comics already. I am actually tempted once yeah, at some point to drive down there because I hear they, you know, basically uh, uh, they have a retail store as well and blow stuff out that's been sitting in the warehouse. So if well, I ever go to Chicago, we, I'll drop by. When we get to geeking, I'll, uh, I, it, it, it might happen. Oh, but I thought that uh, this week we would do the joy of comics because there there are no there are no um, there are no problems in comics just happy accidents. That's what Secret Wars Two was a happy accident. No, it wasn't happy. Uh, it's okay. I mean, remember I did read the Omnibuy, and it wasn't an accident. It was okay. Some of the art was an accident. Yeah. 
and uh, it got real grim towards the end, at least if you're reading New Mutants at the time. But Well, New Mutants was always grim after, uh, pretty much after Bill Sienkiewicz took over the art, New Mutants became very grim. Yeah. <sighs> but I thought we would talk about things we love about comics. What is it about comics, Joe, that still brings you joy? I don't know. Well, then I'll start. Okay, maybe I'll just fly along with you. Um, one of the things that brings me joy about comics, especially in the two major uh, publishers, is the idea of the shared universe. I know that there are times I complain about it, and there are times it can be a pain in the ass. But really, I like the idea that the Human Torch and, and um, Spider-Man are friends. I like that Batman and Superman hang out together. I like that the Justice League is a group of superheroes. I like that the Avengers is kind of well known. I like shared universes. I, I like that uh, if, let's say, um, Fantastic Four fight Doctor Doom, and then he shows up in an Iron Man story a few months later, it reflects what happens in that Fantastic Four story. I've always liked that idea. When I was a kid, and I discovered Marvel, that was one of the things that sucked me in and got me to buy more books because it's like, oh, wow, uh, Spider-Man teamed up with Nova. Now I have to go pick up Nova. Oh, Nova's pretty cool. I'll, I'll read that. Oh, look, Luke Cage showed up in the Fantastic Four. I'll read his book. And the fact that it all kind of tied together. And even in the 70s, there was a, this idea and it, it it came on until probably the 90s when I just kind of decided I was just going to read what I liked. But Marvel was one big continuing story that had ha started in 1939 and was still moving forward. And all the stories were interconnected. There was something unique and fun about that. And I'll go, I guess I'll jump on that idea as well, because there was... One thing that I really enjoyed with the early comics, and it kind of ties into what, like you were saying, but I loved the footnotes. That that was an idea that there was other things going on in the universe, and it, sometimes I felt actually kind of uh, like I was in on 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 the club, you know, especially if it would be like, okay, uh, I, a good example would be the Punisher when he showed up in Captain America and they refer to the last time he showed up in amazing Spider-Man. And I kind of, it, you felt good. It felt good as a young reader. To like, I knew what was going on because I already read that issue or when they referred to things like, Hey, you know, this, hello? uh, hello, this was happened in an earlier issue. Uh, like a, a good one would be like Spider-Man referring to, oh, yeah, I remember meeting the X-Men uh, and going all the way back to, I think it was X-Men 30 or something, you know, the one that I dug out of the, the bargain basement at Schinders. And it just, it made it so I wanted to go find these early stories. And again, this was years, years before eBay, before graphic novels, before digital. So I had to luck out either at my friendly neighborhood comic store and hope he had a condition, uh, or I should say a book in the condition I wanted, uh, or I'd use Mile High's catalog and try ordering it that way, or just like if a Comic-Con come around, you know, like one of the early ones I, I enjoyed going to, now we call it MSP Spring Con. It's coming up. May 18th and 19th, 2019. A lot of stuff happening. The The dealer tables are sold out. The guests are in place. They're they're uh, getting ready to rock. So go to mcbacomiccom.com. Get your advanced tickets. If you got something for the charity booth, you can drop me a quick line. If you just want to see who's coming, you can uh, send them a note, see if they'll, they'll do something for you. Uh, again, with dealers, you could send them a note saying, hey, I'm looking for these books. If you have them, bring them. Uh, I, I can't overemphasize just how much I enjoy continuity, though. Even when when there's like uh, Kurt Buzak's run on Avengers, absolutely loved it because he went back 
and he uh, that will get to freaking or geeking on that too. I mean, it's it's uh, wait. You're, it, this is only the beginning of the show, not the not the end. Oh, I'm telling you, we, we we should just have a show one time where we just start with freaking and geeking because man, it's just bleeding all over. Uh, anyways, Kurt Busiek's Avengers. When in the back of the page where he would talk about people's appearances and things like that, he didn't necessarily clog the story with footnotes, but I just, I love stuff like that. That's why sometimes, it, it, you know, we talked about the the X-Men, where they lost me, because there were like 500 X-Men stories. You didn't know what was going on. You know, for me, the footnotes were fun. Uh, it, DC's kind of lost me a bit because, you know, you got two cutoff points. Crisis on Infinite Earths and New 52, where they just kind of took everything that was beforehand and said, no, we don't need it. Let's just uh, go forward. And you, know, you took away some of the fun, really, for me. You know, I mean, again, we, we've talked about, you know, DC sort of winning us back in ways. But I just continuity was something I, I just absolutely loved. And, and footnotes to me were the big one, you know, as seen in whatever. Or, uh, you know, yes, that we understand Spidey disremembered it, but you can go back to Amazing Spider-Man, your mint copy Amazing Spider-Man 2 and write in the correct version that uh, Spidey's thinking of, you know. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Pull out your Spider-Man number three and get a ballpoint pen. And cross out this panel. <laughs> and when he's, when Doc Ock says Superman, just cross it out and write Spider-Man. Yeah. Gotta correct that. Um, the next thing I have on my list, as my voice is cracking, like I'm, uh, I'm, oh, who was it? Was it Bobby Brady? Peter Brady. Peter Brady, when his voice was changing, they had to change the song for him. That's what I sound like. When it's time to change, you've got to rearrange See, I, I, folks, what I you are and what you're going to be. watched brady bunch at all unless there was absolutely nothing else on television on weekday afternoon so i am i am woefully ignorant on brady bunch the last brady bunch i saw i think they were lost in hawaii and it was oh, amazing yes. because it and, wasn't and so much with the tiki hawaii cup. it looked like they were just in a gravel pit and you know so anyways that's uh that, that that's why I, when Corey goes off in his brady rant i, I just sit back and let him go that that was uh, when they were in Hawaii. They uh, Bobby found a tiki god, and it caused all sorts of trouble. And um, that's why I firmly believe in the tiki god because I don't want to get him angry. Um, the next thing I have on my list is the history. And you would say, Corey, you just talked about the history with the shared universe. No, I don't mean the history of the characters and the world. I mean the history of comics itself. Um, I, when I first got into comics as a, in junior high, the only books in the library about comics were books about comic strips and comic history. And I would just devour them. Um, there was the um, Jules Pfeiffer book, The Comics. Um, they, one of the, the library at the college my mom was going to actually had the first volume of Sternanko's um, History of Comics. They only had the first volume, not the second. And I just started digging in because I'd read the Peanuts books and there were other comic strip books at the time. That was kind of a big thing. You know, you'd have the paperback book that would reprint comic strips. The, you know, Wizard of Id and um, BC and High and Lois. And so I started digging in. I have collections of Little Nemo, Crazy Cat. I have the uh, Marvel Masterworks and DC Archives of the Golden Age stuff, the, um, the Atomic Age stuff. But now we're in this Golden Age where Tomorrow's is putting out tons of historical books. There are other publishers that are putting out books about the history of comics, interviews with people who worked in the in the Golden Age, in the, Bron in the Atomic Age, in the Silver Age on up. I'm just fascinated by the whole history of the medium. Um, every, every month when my box shows up, Roy Thomas teaches me more. Doc Basilero teaches me more. Um, whenever they put out an uh, issue of the um, 
Jack Kirby Collector, which is getting uh, more and more infrequent. I just tear through that stuff. There's uh, more and more websites online that are digging into this, finding um, finding stuff that they used to send to the uh, newsstands to get them to place the comics better. Um, pictures of newsstands just covered in comic books. I love that stuff. And, um, you know, it's drawn me into other parts of history, and it's also really informed me about other parts of history and how a lot of the stories that we've been told may not be true. Um, I've talked a lot in the past about how, you know, as comic fans, we were told, well, the comics code killed comics. And we took it as a matter of faith. And as they've dug into it more, it's, no, the Comics Code kind of got rid of the sleazy publishers, but the thing that really hurt comics was the newsstand distribution collapse of American, what was it, American News in 1956. And it didn't just kill comics, it killed magazines, it killed book publishers, it killed tons of people, it nearly killed Playboy. Think about that. Playboy barely survived its second year because of the newsstand distribution collapse. Does anybody talk about that stuff now? No, only a small group of people. And it kind of has informed me for all the things to question what you've heard about history. You know, why did prohibition take place? Well, it's because of this, this, and this. Well, I watched a six hour documentary and it was very much rural people didn't want the new immigrants coming into the US to gain political power and money. So you had all the German immigrants who were making beer. Oh, we've got to stop that. We don't want these German immigrants to have a lot of political power. So we're going to take away the money by shutting down the breweries. And comics history is a lot like that, too. A lot of the stuff we've heard. And, you know, I'm, I'm not going to berate Stan Lee. Stan had a horrible memory. And once he told a story, if people liked it, he'd tell it again and again and again. But a lot of the stuff that we heard from Stan Lee about Marvel's history, we found out, ah, it didn't quite happen that way. Joe, what's next on your list? Well, what I did like about comics, and I kind of preface this because this is, times are changing. Uh, I think back and of the comics that I just absolutely saw and I used to just die to find. Some of them we've talked about in the past. Uh, what if number one? I, I don't know where what if was when I started buying it, but when I saw that title where uh, what if Spider-Man had joined the Fantastic Four? Oh, my little 12 to 15 year old mind was blown. I had to find it. Just awesome. When uh, I saw Superman versus Spider-Man, I didn't think it was true. I thought it was a, a April Fool's joke. But then my guy was like, no, it came out in a tabloid size. Uh, oh, I had to find it. Uh, I do occasionally, uh, I get some grails. Like uh, I wanted to showcase number one for the longest time because uh, it had firefighters. Isn't it? My grandfather, my dad was a firefighter. And I just wanted to get a hold of it and read it. And uh, I was able to find it. Uh, you know, uh, it, it it just goes on and on. All the you, all the ones that were were hard to find. And again, remember what I just said in the last one, where I had to find the comics. Nowadays, the hunt is not as tough. I mean, sure. I uh, I'll give you an example. I've got Marvel Visionaries. I'm missing book number five because it's out of print and it's allegedly a seventy dollar book. I'm sorry, if I'm dropping seventy dollars, it's going to be on an omnibus, and I got plenty of those I need to pick up. Uh, but you know, occasionally I'll find something that I need that I'll, I'll want to pick up. Uh, case in point, there was a uh, a, a book from uh, Fan Graphic Books called Knuckles the Mal Malevolent. Can I say it? Malevolent Nun. Uh, the reason I want it is because my uh, sister, she always goes on and on about uh, just nuns. I mean, I can tell her we're, we're you know, we're both basically, uh, uh, how would you say it, reformed Catholics. So, 
you know, anytime she sees something about nuns, she's just like, oh, you know, shiver, and she goes on and on. So I figured this would be the perfect birthday gift for her since it's coming up. And, you know, now it's an out-of-print book. It's from Fan Graphics from 1991. Basically, it's, it's uh, and again, from Atomic Avenue, it's a funny series about a grotesquely ugly nun with an attitude to match her looks. Uh, but she's a likable character. So, uh, and then, of course, she's accompanied by Witchbite, a talking crow sent by God to observe her. She's being courted by Lucifer, who happens to wear nothing but a pair of briefs and a pumpkin on his head. And, of course, he's continually <laughs> denied Knuckles' affection. I mean, i got to read this thing before I give it to her as a gift. So, two issues, a book, none to be found on the Ebays, or if they are, they're, they're incredibly expensive. It doesn't have any real back issue price. Uh, I found it on Atomic Avenue. Guy had it for a buck a piece. Two issues for a buck, six dollars shipping. I got her gift. And since she doesn't listen to the podcast unless I have her son on, uh, it that's just the way it goes. So uh, again, th there's no. If you want something nowadays, you you can find it real easy. It's 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 almost the hunt isn't really there anymore. I got to admit, when I have more fun when I go to SpringCon or other conventions. I mean, it used to be, Corey, I don't know if you did this when you were a kid or younger. Did you have like a notebook or the CBG price guide? You had everything down and you, you had the holes you were missing and you needed, you were able to, you'd go to these shows or to a shop and tr go to fill in uh, oh, what yeah. you're missing. I had a want list. And people have it on their phones now, things like that. I don't really have a want list. I mean, I... I You know, I kind of miss having that, you know, the, the, the search. Now, when I go to a shop or when I go to a con, I just I go for the cheap bins and I just start digging because you never know what you'll run into. If I can. I mean, it's not so much a dollar bin, but it's uh, what do we call them now? Dollar, do, yeah, I guess it's not quarter bins, dollar bins and. Uh, the just, cheese just, bins, the cheese bins, you know, just try to find. Yeah, I, I may look at. Uh, at uh, some books, and if I know I have a hole in uh, in a collection, I'll, I'll you know quickly run and try to find that as well. But most of the time, I'm just looking for for like cheap graphic novels. I'm looking for just cheap books. A lot of it I talk about on the eBay's, you know, because it's just unique things that I found. Uh, the the one that uh, I remember talking about that really impressed me was when I found this little Captain Marvel Junior uh, thing that was peeled off of General Mills cereal boxes. Consequently, you cannot find a mint one because to read it, you had to peel it off, thereby ripping it off the uh, the box. And I, I never knew about that. You know, it's one of the giveaways from uh, the, the late 40s. And uh, they actually, had the ones that you do find that look like they're in mint shape, they actually sold those at, I guess cigar shops or whatever, or newsstands or whatever, where you could just go buy it for a nickel. And uh, I just found this for a buck in some guy's cheese bin, you know, and he obviously knew what it was because this is one of those guys who, you know, inhales collections and brings them to shows. But for a buck, I was able to learn a little bit of history, kind of like what you were talking about earlier, Courier. I ended up, you know, just selling out on eBay because... Once I figured out what it was, it was just kind of fun. And it moved on. And uh, I actually, in one of the eBay segments in the past, talked a bit about it. So hopefully, if that doesn't give you a reason to go back and download some of them old episodes, I, I, I got nothing for you. So Knuckles, the malevolent nun. Keep it under your hat. And I'll let you know what my sister thinks about it when she gets it. <laughs> now, did you get her warrior nun, uh, whatever that book was? She no, see, because that's a that's more good girl art, and she might be she might think it's humorous, but it, it's the ugly nun type thing, oh. you know that that uh, that she kind of, which is why I thought this was just uh, outrageous that I found it. I mean, the writer Cornelia Stone, artist Roger Landridge. Uh, oh, again, Roger Landridge, his yeah. stuff is great. Oh, see, now I got you He's interested. The guy who did the Muppet, uh, the Muppet uh, comic book. And a few other books. It's sad that he's kind of wandered away from comics. Joe, next time you see it, there was a Thor series he did with Chris Samney. It only lasted eight issues. The best Thor stories uh, in the past 20 years. 
Do you remember what, what more than it was? It a, a like a mini series or was it? No, it was supposed to be a regular series, but it didn't sell very well, so they only did eight issues. I'd have to. I will look. Not astonishing, the... Thor, was it? No. Okay. It See? was uh, Chris Samney and Roger, Roger Landridge. All right, I, I will dig through Atomic Avenue and try to find it while you're uh, you're getting on to your next one that you dig. What the joy I, of comics. The next thing uh, is something only comics can do. And that is art that tells a story. I read a lot of novels. I look at a lot of art. But comics blends the two in a way that no other medium can. And when it's done well, it tells stories in a way that no other medium can. Um, they're a unique blend of art and storyline. Um, the past three years have shown that the art can do anything. You can have cartoony art. You can have the Bigfoot traditional funny art. You can have the, the painted realism of, of Alex Ross. You can have the off the wall surrealism of Bill Sienkiewicz, who, you know, will paint pages and jam stuff onto the painting and scratch and tear at it. And, and it will tell the story. Or you can have people who do, um, like uh, Scott McCloud, who plays with the form itself and uses the panel borders to tell part of the story. Um, there's, Nothing else can do it. You can go to an art gallery and see some beautiful art. And you can get a feeling from it. But it can't tell a story. It can't have something with a beginning, middle, and end. Um, and every kind of comic. You know, I we, we talk mostly about Marvel and DC. Because Marvel and DC really are kind of, you know, they're... they're they're kind of where we hang out, but there's other stuff like Paper Girls and Saga and autobiographical books and books like uh, It's a Good Life If You Don't Weaken by Seth, which I recommend whenever anybody says, oh, well, what comic do you think I would like? If they haven't read comics before, I recommend that one because it's not superheroes. It's not anything outrageous. It's a simple story about people. You can do all of those things in this medium. Um, you can play with time in comics in a way you can't with film or TV or even books, where the artist can cause you to linger over a certain page or rush you through the page. Um, just uh, pick up that Hawkeye 11 with uh, Matt Fraction and David Aja, where the entire story is told from the point of view of the dog. You can't do that in any other medium. You can't do it in in movies because there's so much of the dog thinking in pictures. You can't do it in books because, you know, you could say the dog did this and the dog did that, but you can't use the physical language of, of the dog. It can only be done in comics. And I'm glad that, you know, when, that comics kind of grew up when I did. Because by the time I was in uh, junior high, you know, comics were pretty much, you know, aimed at junior high kids. Then by high school, it started the direct market and they could do more mature stuff. And by the time I was in college, you know, the underground had burst through to the mainstream. You had Mouse, you had Alan Moore really pushing the boundaries of what could be done at a mainstream comic level. And by the time I got out of college, you know, you had the whole 80s uh, indie boom where they were just trying everything and artists were doing whatever they could. And you had, ver then after that, you had Vertigo and you had Image get away from their shared universe and more into individual artistic visions. And there's just something that comics, these are things comics do that you can't do anywhere else. Yeah, you can make a great Avengers movie. But you can't make a 12-part story that pulls from 60 years worth of history and uses different artistic styles to show those different time periods. Um, it's just, the, I, I love reading a good comic because there's, there's something there I can't get anywhere else. Joe? 
I'm, I'm, I was listening to you. I got totally, totally lost. However, <laughs> I will say the name of it is Thor, the Mighty Avengers. That's it. He's banished. He's mad. He wants to fight. And, of course, he battles robots the size of city. He, you can gasp as he tames the mightiest sea creatures. You can swoon as he rescues damsels from the vilest villains. It's Thor as you have never, ever, I, I threw that in, seen him. And and this is something I like about comics today. It's almost the mirror opposite of what we talked about. All right, see if you can listen in. Did you hear that? Yeah, I, I just bought it. Uh, for ten bucks, I found I found issues the 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 collected series one and two, and uh, based on Corey's recommendation, I am buying them. And that's almost the mirror image of what today's joy in comics has uh, that I am able to Corey recommend something or somebody say, Hey, if you check this out and I can just turn around and here it comes ready there. I just PayPal it. I just bought it. Uh, things are so widely available. If it's not Marvel unlimited. And again, I haven't really jumped on the digital scene. Uh, there was news from the, from the last week where DC's, finally putting their comic book content online. Haven't heard good things about the delivery, but the fact is they're trying. So many other things are available digitally. We constantly, what, what's the name of that place who, who like for 10 bucks will give you access to thousands of titles and uh, proceeds um, go to Comic Buyers Defense Fund or... Oh, um, Humble Bundle. Yeah, there's, there's things like that. Uh, there's a couple other ones available. So finding things, it's easier than ever. I mean, if it's not eBay, it's Amazon. If it's not Amazon, uh, hopefully, you know, a, a local con, you can borrow friends. I talked about reading Ms. Marvel from the library. So the stuff's available. It's kind of weird, you know, as Corey attests, you know, he, he follows the how books are selling and the orders always seem to be going on a downhill slope. But the popularity of the, the media and the characters are bigger than ever. Yeah, yeah, some of it's from the movies. But, you know, for everybody who complains about, well, you know, Ms. Marvel, that's not for me. I can tell you a dozen of kids that are sitting at the library now probably reading the books, even as we're recording this here podcast. So, again, the availability of stuff just makes comics enjoy, uh, very, very enjoyable. You know, I, and, of course, dummy me. I didn't even – I didn't even – Mention your friendly local comic shop. Odds are you can walk in if they don't have it on their shelves. You could ask them to order it. And if they're worth their weight in uh, back issues, they will do that for you. So, again, everything's available. Uh, just, it's, you know, there's a little bit of hunting to do, but now it's like everything's just online. You should be able to find it. I got Knuckles. I found Knuckles. I got Thor. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, next thing on my list is uh, story types. Comics can tell any kind of stories, but there are some that really work best in comics. Um, one of the big things we're, we're supposedly in this golden age of television, one of the things about it is that they're doing long-form stories, season-long stories, things like that. Well, comics have been, you know, mainstream superhero comics have been doing that forever. I it, you know, look at the look at when we started buying comics. They were all continued stories. The plot threads would weave in and out. Stories could, you know, some subplots would take years to resolve. But it was a long form storytelling where once you got past like 1967, 68, it was just the illusion of change at Marvel. But it felt like important things were happening. Um, there were, the stakes were big for the characters, not just the universe will be destroyed, but there was also Reed and Sue Richards are are going to get a divorce. And that was a storyline that took a year to run its course. And back in the 70s, that was something that hadn't been talked about in comics before. And even in, I remember as a kid, I'd watch TV shows and one of the things that always bugged me is nothing ever changed. You know, maybe uh, maybe uh, Richie would uh, 
to dump his girlfriend, but once he settled on a girlfriend who had her name in the credits, they were together forever. Or, you know, if Fonzie had a change, oh, he got a job. We didn't even know Fonzie had jobs, things like that. There, But also, you know, the short story, the horror short story. Nobody else is doing short stories anymore. Comics can still do horror short stories. They could do big science fiction adventures. They could do satire in a way that even a good satire novel or TV show can't do. There are stories that work best in comics. Yes, I could go to the movie theater and see a Spider-Man story. But can I get a Spider-Man story where he's just helping out Aunt May for an issue and the superhero stuff's in the background? Nope. I gotta buy a comic book for that. Or you know, a lot of experimental stuff. A lot of the crime comics that are coming out, you can't do that sort of thing in movies and TV because they're just not built for that type of story anymore. Um, you can get experimental. We've talked a lot about that. But just the, the range of stories that can be done in comics always blows me away. When I started reading comics, there were kids' comics and superhero comics. Now you name a subject, and there's a comic about it somewhere. Joe? I'm, 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 I'm just I'm trying to think a little bit, uh, and, and I don't have any examples here, but one of the, the things I absolutely love with comics and I, I, again, I don't think you can pull this off in another media. Uh, maybe it'd be really hard, but I love turning the page to the big reveal. You know, it could be uh, uh, the one that comes to mind is like Secret Invasion Thor, where uh, Thor isn't involved in the fight. He gives his hammer to Beta Ray Bill who's busy fighting the weird scroll God while he's off doing something and uh, probably giving, helping a, a lady give birth. And basically beta Ray bills man is had his ass kicked. He, the, the bad guy's going to win. And all you hear is stand down friend. And you turn the page and there is, you know, Thor right there. Just, I, I'll take over from here. And I just geek every time they pull that. And it, it's, it, they do it over and over. And it's it's something that the, the writer and the artist has to plan out because it has to be the page turn. They cannot have that sequence on one side with the page reveal on the next, you know, right across from it. It's got to be the last page page it's got to have an ad page somewhere it's got to be so you physically turn that page and get that reveal and they do it time and time again uh i i, I geek for it every time or like in wrestling I, I mark for it every time i see hulk hogan do his leg drop i mark out for it i just absolutely love it and uh, I wish you could see just how messy my room is because I've been tearing it apart trying to do the Ebays and stuff. And uh, I, I just finished reading an, an issue where they did that exact same thing, where it was kind of like the the hero looks like everything's sad, and I and you so well, and then you turn the page, <laughs> maybe it's my turn to play or something like that, where you're just oh I. I can you think of any examples like that, Corey? I'm just, I'm going nuts trying to find the comic I like read a mere hour ago. Well, there's always, my favorite example of something like that is the uh, Avengers by George Perez, where um, it looks, you know, everything has fallen apart, the heroes have lost, and all of a sudden you you hear a big, you know, you, there's a big explosion, you turn the page and there's Thor Ultron, we would have words with thee. Oh, perfect. But uh, when I get to when we get to geeking, I'm reading Savage Sword of Conan, and there would be these huge, you know, you'd turn the page, and here would be this two-page spread by John Buscema or uh, Barry Windsor Smith. Just beautiful detail setting the scene. Or... Um, when Kirby got to DC, one of the things he always did, he'd have the, the first page of the story. But then you'd turn it, and there'd be this 
beautiful two-page spread. And you just look at it and just almost drool over the art. And he kept doing that at Marvel, too. Um, I'm rereading The Eternals. And that second issue where the spaceship first shows up. And, you know, Kirby takes two pages and shows the people, you know, in the foreground. It's tiny to give you a sense of how impressive and huge this thing is. Or when you get the look at the first Celestial. Um, or even, you know, the Fantastic Four number 48. The entire issue leads up to Galactus showing up. It's something that movies can do, but they don't do it as well as that page turn reveal. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking, and, and again, this is something I'll geek on more in geeking, but I, I'm reading X-Men Battle of the Atom. And they, you, right as I was getting to the point, you they had to sing it. It had to have been just old school thinking from, from Bendis or, or whoever. Is do, I don't know who's doing the art in the, in the crossover here. <laughs> But it's like X Men attack, and I turn the page right as you were describing Kirby's two page, and this is just two pages of the X Men fighting the foes, and it's it just sings like that. But then I, I went back a couple issues because they, and what, I think what they did is they put the covers in here, which is cool. But then this is a, an example of a, a ruined reveal where the X Men are done, the, the young X Men are being beaten. The, the the villain of X Men from the future are are uh, you know blah 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 blah. What does that mean? And you hear off panel. I think it means. And you turn the page, and here comes Cyclops in with the current X Men. You really screwed yourself. But in the book, the two pages are side by side, so it, it doesn't have the same impact. Whereas if they were able to to put it in a blank page, and again, I know blah blah, it costs extra. But it, it's much more fun to have that reveal. So that that's something that, yeah, comics can only do that. Uh, doesn't quite work the same in movies. And then the last thing that I have, uh, fandom. I have a love-hate relationship with fandom, Joe. Uh, Jeez, there, there are times when uh, comic fans piss me off more than any anything on this planet the the when the, the the gatekeeping the 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 slavish need to over talk and to you know superman wouldn't do that okay and or you know the the relentless nitpicking but there's also that was the first place when I was a teenager that I kind of felt accepted. You know, we had this in common. We liked superhero comics. And when I got into college, it was the same thing. The first place I really felt accepted was at the local comic shop. When I moved here to Minnesota, first group of people that I made friends with were comic fans. I'd go to comic shop and start talking to people that's how i got involved in the mcba conventions before they were before they got started that's there you know I'm, I'm drawn to that but there are times when like any other group they just they get too possessive of what they like or they try to keep people out or when new people come in they um well you don't you're not a real fan you don't know the real story of blah 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 and one of the things that happens lately is when someone, you know, when you mention something and someone says, oh, I haven't seen that. There are two ways to handle that. Most of the time I see a fan go, what do you mean you haven't seen that? That's something you have to have seen. What, how can you call yourself a fan if you don't blah, 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 blah. Whereas me, on the other hand, I was talking with someone at work. And they said they'd never seen Mystery Science Theater 3000 before. My reaction was, oh, my God, I am so envious of you. You get to see this wonderful thing that I love and so many people love for the first time. You have a, oh, you have got a treat ahead of you. Because if you like this, there are hundreds of episodes of, of this. And you're going to be able to just 
dive in and enjoy it the way the rest of us do. Or with comics, there's a lot of, well, if you haven't read blah, 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 you're not a real fan. Whereas on the other hand, I'm someone who's like, you haven't seen George Perez's work? Oh, man, you've got to look at this and this and this and his Wonder Woman. You're, you're just, you're going to be blown away by how good he is. Or with Kirby, you know, oh, you haven't read Jack Kirby? Oh, here, here's a Fantastic Four book. You're, you're going to enjoy that. There are pockets of terribleness in all fandoms. Science fiction fans can be a royal pain in the ass. Fantasy fans, role players, all of them. But if you're in a group where you all speak the common language, there is kind of a community there. There's a sense of belonging there. And that's what I like about it. I don't like the, you know, that girls can't, girls shouldn't be making comics. Or if you haven't been reading comics for 20 years, you're not a real fan. You know what? You get it a lot with the cosplayers when people want to quiz the cosplayers. They spent more time making their costume than you spent reading the last five issues. So shut up. They enjoy the character. You enjoy the character. Why not talk about what you have in common rather than look for things to bash people about? So um, fandom. Love fandom. But man, I can hate fandom too. Joe? I think I'm just going to end with that because I, I've, I was kind of what I was talking, thinking too, because uh, one of the things that, that, no, I'm amazed that I can still make friends. First of all, it gets harder as you get older because you get set in your ways. But the fact that I've made a lot of good friends that I, you know, I may only see them once or twice a year at the con, but when I do, we just pick up from where we left off. Uh, I've been lucky that I've been able to travel around the country and, and, uh, you know, I did that for five years, and the first thing I always checked out was where the local comic shops. And it was always amazing. You know, you get in there, and these are people, they speak the same language. What's even more fun is when they're, hey, where are you from? Oh, Minnesota. Really? Where? Oh, St. Paul. Did you know such and such a person? It's, you know, Nick Post was always the big name. You know, do you know Nick? Yeah, I do. So a lot of fun. And I just, it, it's something I, I, I think about this every so often, and you know, Corey and I gush on and on every so often, but the fact that when we first started this podcast, we just were doing the podcast. And Corey shares with me the numbers. What, what, what are we up to now? 2,000? Uh, we get about 2,200 downloads the first month. That's amazing. That's 2,000 people that I either I, – I know I only know a, a handful of you, but we – you know. The fact that we've been able to grow like that, and we're not really pushing it. We're, you know, every other day I turn on and I say, "Oh, Kevin Smith's got another podcast," and I just kind of, uh, well, yeah, he's got the name. He can get the sponsors. He can, he can get people that'll listen just because it's him. Uh, but I also have a friend, and I, I hope to have him on the show uh, once he gets up and, and more confidence. But he's been working kind of on the movie end of things for years. And then he's finally realized people aren't necessarily watching cable access shows anymore because cable access is kind of dying, but he also wants to do podcasts. And I, you know, I told him, well, get a hold of Corey here. He, he knows more of the technical end and, and uh, you know, even our, our buddy Dags from uh, Amish baby machine. And he's, he's thinking the same way. This is just something he wants to do. He's got a creative outlet. He wants to let it go. I hope, when he uh, gets going that I can't, we can get him involved on this here podcast, maybe help him. I said, that's one of the big things we've been lucky and we've been pleased to do is to help promote things. You know, when, when uh, Adam Vermillion was doing panels and pizza and I, I'm not sure what he's doing now that he's down in Iowa. Uh, Iowa stuff. It, yeah. Iowa stuff. Uh, anytime, you know, we can tie in or we can promote a creator or we can do something. Uh, we're, we're willing to do it. We're help, happy to do it. And I am just amazed that, that you folks, well, it's what, two, 2,200 right away. And in five months, I've, I've seen numbers, what, up to 5,000? 5, 5,000 yeah. people. These are unique downloads. Okay, 4,999 4, because one of them is me. I always download the episode just to archive it on my hard drive. So, And, and for, for me, and, I'm, and I'll, I, I'm, I'll speak for Corey, although he, he's much better at speaking than I am, thank you. I, I appreciate it. I, I look forward 
to doing it every week because I mean this is just like uh well it's 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 one of the big things I, I was sad about when I sold hot comics is and I told Corey this is every Friday we all were together and we got to go geeking. We talked comics, everybody got together, we went out for pizza, we'd come back, the poker game may break out, we may sit in front of the parking lot and uh talk about crap all night long. And with the shop gone I don't have that, but with the podcast, I feel like I've got a little bit of it back because I get to talk to one of my best friends, Corey, every week, and uh, you guys are along for the ride. We appreciate it. That's all. Well, you know who else is along for the ride, Joe? I hope they appreciate it. These guys, our sponsors. Yay. That's right. Here at the Solitaire Rose Radio Network, we have ads, and our first sponsor is me. That's right, your charming and delightful old Uncle Rap Bastard. I have my first book out with Dangerous Dan Moore. It's the first hundred strips of our online web strip, Worldwide News, the story of the lowest rated cable news network. And you can get yourself a copy with commentary, with all sorts of extras, with uh, signatures and everything. Just email Dan over at LordShadowFlame at gmail.com. Our top sponsor, who's been with us since day one, is DreamHost. DreamHost.com. You need yourself a website, and DreamHost.com is the number one web host in the whole known universe. Just head over to DreamHost.com, put in the code CRAZY, K-R-A-Y-Z, get $20 off your first year. How can you beat that? Our other sponsor is Graze, G-R-A-Z-E.com. Healthy snacks for a healthy lifestyle. Just head over to Gray's, put in the code C-O-R-Y-S-3-R-5-P. Your first and fifth box are free. You can get them weekly. You can get them bi-weekly. You can get them monthly. You just order a whole bunch of them. It's great stuff to keep you away from the vending machine at work. Now, if you would like to leave a comment for any of the podcasts that we do, we'd love those. Go ahead and email us at solitairerosenetwork at gmail.com, or you can call 952-856-0519. Operators are standing by. Okay, it's just a place that will record your calls, but we'll play them on the air. We'll answer your questions. We love getting feedback. Tell us what you think. Ask a question. Suggest a topic. Be a guest. Send us your stuff. Solitaire Rose Network at gmail.com. If you would like to advertise on any of the Solitaire Rose radio shows, you can. Just email us at Solitaire Rose Network at gmail.com. Subject advertising. Thanks. And this isn't the only podcast I do. No, no, no. That would be crazy if I just did one podcast. I do all of these. The Solitaire Rose Radio Network has all sorts of podcasts for you. There's, of course, Crazy Comics and Stories, where myself and Crazy Joe Ryder get together once a week to talk comics. We review comics, we talk about upcoming comics, we talk about comics history, anything that has to do with comics, we're going to talk about. We also have Series in Review, where we review series and kind of give a DVD commentary of past comics that we've enjoyed. There is also Solitaire Rose Radio. Solitaire Rose Radio is my solo show where I discuss upcoming comics, past comics, comics history, and interview comics creators. These are all at crazycomics.solitairerose.com. There's also the podcast I'm proudest of. That's Novelcast, where I take the novels that I have written and turn them into audiobooks. That's at novels.solitairerose.com. Over at Bad Advice, myself, Dan Moore, and Wolfie B. Bad take your questions and give you bad advice. It's at badadvice.solitairerose.com. Now, don't think that I'm doing all the podcasts, because there's also Scrabbling Across the West by Dave Coffell and Stephanie Coffell. Dave is a musician, and Stephanie is his wife. They travel the country performing music and playing Scrabble over at scrabbling.solitairerose.com. And finally, the newest member of the Solitaire Rose Radio Group. That's Fantastic Forecast, where myself and host of For the Love of Comics, Adam Vermillion, go over the series The Fantastic Four, four issues at a time. That's available at fantasticforecast.solitairerose.com. If you would like to advertise on any of these podcasts, you can. Just email me at, at Network at gmail.com. Thanks.
see we're getting better at these segues after 400 I, well episodes. i just figure if i just shut up and let you do it we can get to my favorite part of the show where we we turn the paint smudge into birds i i i, th- I thought it was when we we advertised that we are now fat free with low salt and gluten free oh no no i put my foot down i like my gluten no 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 we are gluten free yeah but i that's just because I have you know, a lot of fiber in me, I just push it right out. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. No, it's uh, Joe's favorite part of the show. Free, uh, what's going on on the eBay's? So I do like freaking and geeking. And uh, being that we've had a couple special shows the last couple of weeks, I uh, I got a ton of stuff that we've been selling. And some of it's kind of unique. Uh, I don't know, Corey, if you ever – have you ever gone into a comic store on their local comic book day? I didn't even know there was such a thing as yeah, a comic it, book day. It's kind of like there's a record store version yeah, of it. Yeah, I know there's a free comic book. There's a record store day. There was a comic book day of some kind, but I just know free comic book day. Yeah, no, free comic book day is there, but they also, what they do is they have local comic book day. And I am going to uh, we'll fire up the old Cray 3000 and the see. The Craynometer? Uh, See uh, local comic book day. It's a four-year-old event conceived and implemented by Comic Pro, and what they do is they put together uh, usually a bunch of different exclusive variant covers based on whatever properties. Uh, the last one I see was November seventeenth. There are stores that participate in it, and. They have exclusive items that are available, not all items available. So it's a lot like a mirror image of, of Record Store Day. So, uh, and if you go to, I believe, localcomicshopday.com, you'll be in the know when it finally comes around. Uh, and they don't have an update for this year, but, you know, the year's still young. So that said, I had a number of local Comic Book Day variant covers. Uh, sometimes, you know, I found mine at the source. One of them was Back to the Future, which was the IDW series. Uh, if you like Back to the Future, that you should go read this because it's kind of fun. It fills in a lot of the gaps either before, after, or during that the movie doesn't. So I found that it was it was an enjoyable run. I believe it's over now, so you should be able to pick it up either as graphic novel or as uh, back issues. Uh, again, Spring Con. Uh, I don't have many on eBay, so you, you can find them there, but I won't be able to help you. I did sell two of my DC showcase. These are the essential big black and white ones. Uh, some of them are kind of pricey. One of them was The Haunted Tank, Volume 1. And uh, the other one was The House of Mystery, Volume 1. These all came out in 2006. I I'm always they, – they, they take up a lot of room, and I got to admit, when I was – reading them i just i don't know they just didn't they didn't hit me you know what i'm saying you, you i remember talking with Corey when i was reading the phantom stranger showcase which i did keep because i like the character i'm like you know what these are really formulamatic it's almost like the same story just different settings and when you're trying to read it all one at a time it, it just yeah i've read these over and over and eventually they get into the 20s and, and the story format changes but uh there's just a couple i Let's let's ask the Strode, Corey. Have you read the Haunted Tank or the House of Mystery? Yes, um, I picked up a lot of those DC showcases, and I've talked about it in the past. A lot of the DC stuff from the Silver Age does not read well if you're going to read a bunch of them in order. Um, I think that's why Marvel eventually outsold DC. DC, you picked up the Haunted Tank, and you know if you read it once a month. Okay, well, you know, there's a little bit of twist on the story. There's this, there's that. But reading four or five in a row, it's pretty much, oh, man, this is the same story over and over. It's why I didn't care for Superman during the Mort Weisinger era, because it was all gimmicks. Um, The Flash under Julie Schwartz. It's okay. Here's a villain with a weird gimmick. How does the Flash figure out how to defeat his gimmick with his super speed? Um. And it was very much, okay, we've created the formula, just move the pieces around a little bit. Whereas Marvel, yeah, they had a formula, but they also had all the soap opera stuff. 
so that, okay, Spider-Man's going to fight the villain. The villain will beat the tar out of him. Um, he'll figure out how to beat the villain the, in their second fight. And But you had all the superhero stuff going on behind the scenes. I'm sorry, all the soap opera stuff. So um, I learned pretty quickly with those Silver Age DCs, maybe read one one or two of the stories and then read a bunch of other stuff and then maybe in a month read one or two of the stories some of them weren't like that like doom patrol was one that you could read you could binge read um i loved those bronze age horror books from dc house of mystery house of secrets witching hour um sinister house secrets of the sinister house i love those but mostly it's because of that beautiful Filipino art they were using at the time. Because the stories were kind of tame horror stories. But, oh, man, some of the art in those was just unbelievably good. Bernie Wrightson, Jeff jo um, Jeff Jones, um, you know, all the Filipino artists. Uh, you even had um, Alex Nino doing stuff in there. Oh. <laughs> There, I've got you off track, Joe. Back back to eBay. No, no. See, that's what I like about this is just things that maybe our listeners never have heard of yet. Now they, they, they might go out and, hey, maybe this haunted take might be fun to check out. Or maybe, like what I just sold, Man-Thing, the third series that was written by J.M. Matias and artist Liam Sharp. Uh, I don't know if this has ever been done in a graphic novel format, but the third series basically ran eight issues and then kind of went into ended, Strange Tales. Yeah, yeah, into the fourth series. So well, I just there was a the, Strange Tales series which had Man Thing and Werewolf by Night. Well, and this it, one was just yeah, Man Thing, and it did it does say Strange Tales on it, although it's it's Man Thing Volume Three, and I had the complete run. And I just sold it as a complete run. So, and I imagine if you look, you could probably find it. Uh, there was a black Amazing Spider-Man presents Black Cat, so 2010, written by uh, Jen Van Meter and artist Javier Paludo. And this is basically uh, Black Cat in her own series, international intrigue. Uh, it's a five issue or four issue miniseries, and there's a book available. I had the the miniseries. I don't even recall reading it, which again is for me a death knell if I'm trying to decide what to keep, what to get rid of. Sometimes it's just things that you never thought of would sell. Way back in 1996, Marvel came out with Ultra Girl, which is uh, Marvel's turn for the grim and gritty backlash. Is a cross between Gen 13 and Impulse. Three issues. I know the characters showed up elsewhere. I just happened to have a run together. I priced it accordingly and uh, and just let it fly. Uh, I sold the Infinity Gauntlet, the Secret Wars tie-in one. Uh, I don't remember much about it. I think, uh, who who was the the young girl who's Iron, is it Ironheart? When we were yeah. placed? I think it's her family. And they have the Infinity Gauntlet and the, the Infinity Gauntlet. And then the real Thanos, who, you know, from Secret Wars, rode along into the Battle World universe, is going after it. Uh, so that was kind of fun. And uh, some of the other things, I don't even know how far back I've, I've mentioned. Because I, I sold a run of SpongeBob Comics 32 to 36, which had Mermaid Man in it. The Showdown at Shady Shoals. Uh these were books that a lot of people either weren't picking up or just the SpongeBob people found out about because they price around ten twenty dollars a piece. I just had a whole run. Somebody made a decent offer. And I said okay. Not everything I sold is comics, so I actually sold a Superpowers nineteen eighty five fold up calendar that was just in excellent shape. It actually came in some of the bigger toys, and I'm looking at the art on it. I, I the poster side I can't tell. It doesn't really look like Kirby. Maybe you know I, I'll have to forward this to Corey and see if he can uh, uh, see if it if if he thinks it's it's uh, Kirby or not. But uh, that's that one of those things that I I uh, mentioned. You know, the, sometimes the accessories can be uh, more expensive than the uh, the actual toy. 
And uh, this one actually dates all the way back. I had this back in my comic shop. So it's it's from 1985, and it sat in my comic shop well, however long it did, and I just ended up selling it. I've been putting lots of stuff on uh, on the Ebays. Things have been selling really fast. Uh, so if, you, if you're really interested, check it out, Crazy, K-R-A-Y-Z. And if you tell me you're a listener of this here podcast, I'll, uh, I usually toss in a little something extra for you. You know, it could be, uh, well, you know, I got that. I got the hot wheel here. I was talking about that. Uh, the Tesla Roadster that uh, Musk shot into orbit, still orbiting the sun. Boy, the first guy, I tell you, space collectibles is going to be the biggest thing on the Ebays. I mean, first person gets to the moon and gets all that Apollo gear. Oh man, we're gonna they'll make a they'll make a mint on it. Could you imagine what a mint piece of Skylab would be worth? <laughs> Date that one. Google that one, my my old friends. Uh, by the way, I, I just want to remind people. I've told this story on the podcast before. Back in 1979, I had, you know, Joe, do you remember when you would go to the mall and they would have the the store there where you could make your own T-shirts? Yes. Uh, I had one that said "Welcome back, Skylab." <laughs> My oh, parents thought it was funny, but there were teachers at school who said I was not allowed to wear it at school anymore. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, heaven forbid anybody asks, hey, what's Skylab? It's a teachable moment. I mean, it's a piece of space history. Well, at the time, it was more, you know, we're really worried that Skylab's going to fall and, and hurt people. Yeah. Yeah, whatever. You you obviously haven't read anything, so okay, whatever. Good luck with that. Joe, and you need to end with your uh, with your line. I, I have a line for the eBay segment. Yeah, come get some. Oh no, I don't. I, I, I can't infringe on Duke Nukem every week. Oh, okay. Because I was going to say, well, Duke Nukem sure not going to be using it. Yeah, okay. When well, I come get some. <laughs> And now we get to my favorite part of the show. No, 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 not where I have Joe tell us about how many hours he spent playing Duke Nukem 3D at the comic shop. Although oh. that would be fun. I, 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 to be fair, I, I did use the the King cheat code where I got everything and nobody uh, nobody could kill me. No, 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 it's a freaking a geeky Joe. What are you freaking on? I uh, stopped down uh, a number of weeks ago at our good buddy at. Cedar Cliff Collectibles. I was talking to Steve Brown, the man of renown, who's all about town, usually with a frown. Kind of gets you down because we were talking about uh, back issues. And there's a number of shops in town that, uh, I don't know, that that may or may not be around by the end of the year. It's kind of sad. Or it could just be utter bullshit. I don't know. But he brought up a point. Corey, do you remember... When I had my shop in the 90s, how much, if you came in with a comic book collection and it was Drek, what I would offer you for a box of comics? I mean, we're talking um, about a box of comics, you know. So it'd be, depending on if you bag a board of anywhere from 250 to 300 comics in it. Uh, normally you'd go, I know when I was with Shinders, they said unless it's a key book, I'll offer them 10 cents each. Yeah. For me, it was about $20 a long box. And I would tell people that's a little less than 10 cents each. Yeah. And again, it also depends on what's in it. There would be times I'd tell people, I'd say, OK, here's what's happened. You got 50 long boxes. You got a run of John Byrne, Chris Claremont's X-Men. I'm going to make my money on that. Everything else is just fodder. I will probably close the store and it'll probably still be here. And oddly enough, I was right. Because I had 23, no, 230 long boxes after an entire month of selling stuff, 70% off. I still had 230 long boxes of stuff that just didn't sell. And, you know, that was even me going through and pulling stuff that I wanted to keep or that I was going to sell on eBay. Because if you remember, this was, you know, I, I mean, it, I after 9-11, so I, I had no doubt there was no way I was going to find a decent job. So I eBayed a lot of stuff, uh, and yeah, and then when I had Crazy Comics, it was about ten dollars a long box. Right now, Steve tells me they they're going you you buy direct like that at about eight dollars a long box. Yeah, I, 
we've talked about it. I mean, despite the fact that we just talked about the joy that I get anyways, when I'm digging back issues and finding fun stuff, back issues just aren't selling as much. And, uh, you know, the stores that are trying to depend on that or have a large layout of back issues might be hurting a little bit more. Uh, you know, there's been times I've gone to stores, whether they're local or, or some out of, out of city ones, and you're like, you got the same amount of back issues and you've been selling them over and over. You really got to do something desperate. Uh, and sometimes, you know, you might need to take a loss. I mean, I've been having a good good run of uh, selling stuff on the Ebays, but uh, just take a second while I look up. You know, I mentioned that, that Man Thing third series. Uh, they're, they're dollar boxes. I mean, they're not, they're not anything collectible. And, uh, let's see, I, uh, what did I do with that? I bundled that sucker together and let me see what I done. I done sell it for dun, 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 $12.99. So, you know. And that is, I can guarantee to you, is probably the cheapest price on eBay because that's the way I work. Uh, it's a it's a buyer's market for back issues, and it's it's just I don't see anything improving. And uh, if if you're, I think it's old guys like you and me, Corey, that that even care to buy back issues because I think with my younger kids, they they're graphic novels, they're digital, or they just they go without. I mean, when's the last time you bought a trade paperback, brand new? Um, I got a box of them on Thursday. Yeah. I mean, when, <laughs> when's the last time, though, you went into a store and bought one? Do you even do that anymore, or are you just an online guy? I'm just an online guy because, you know, Amazon, um, eBay, in stock trades, cheapgraphicnovels.com. I. It, for me, the nearest comic shop would be Captain Jack's. They've got a terrible um, graphic novel trade paperback selection. Um, to get to a shop that has a good trade paperback selection, like Nostalgia Zone or The Source, that's, you know, 45 minutes there, then 45 minutes back, or click, click, it shows up in my house at three days. Or like I'm I sorry. did, I bought the Mighty Thor just right online. Corey mentioned yeah. it. I ordered it. That's just that simple. So, yeah, I do support my local comic shop. I do go to Barnes and Noble. I do su I do support as as best I can. But uh, it's a, there's a lot out there. It's good and it's bad. It's a race to the bottom, and I just hope we don't lose some good comic stores in the meantime. Uh, that's pretty much what I'm freaking on, Corey. What you freaking on? Um, this weekend, I had some time off. I started watching TV. I uh, got some stuff done. I had did three podcasts that I mixed. And by the end of the weekend, I was exhausted. Um, just getting stuff done around the house, uh, all the stuff at work, I've learned how tired my eyes are making me. It's one of the things that I hadn't really thought about, but after reading up more on the cataracts and everything, there's a reason why when I come home after my day at the office job, I just don't want to do anything. It's because I've been pushing my eyes and straining to read the computer screen and to see this and to see that. Um, so I'm really looking forward to when that will get fixed because the more I read about it, the more my outlook on life will get better. I will be a lot less tired, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I didn't have as much time to read this weekend as I would have liked, so I didn't get a lot of reading done in comics or books or anything else, but I did get some naps. Joe, what you geeking on? I saw us. Oh, I'm not talking about a picture of me and Corey, but I, I went out and saw the movie Us, which uh, I, I can't remember who, who uh, well, let me see. I'll, I'll just fire up the, since it's already fired up, let's uh, type in the word Us movie. Uh, Corey, have you heard about this movie? Yes, I have. It's uh, from Jordan Peele. 
who did the movie, um, God, what was that called last year? What was his horror movie last year? Get Out. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. And, and he's doing the Twilight Zone remix, which... Uh, which the first episode of the first new Twilight Zone is available for free on YouTube. Now... So I'm going to be watching that this week. I'm not big on horror films. I mean, I don't like it. And I was sitting watching the Jason show, which is the local media guy who I just absolutely love because the show is so much fun. He not only dishes on, on local and uh, na- national celebrities, but then he also promotes a lot of local restaurants and events and themes and things like that. A very personable guy. And he talked about the movie Us, and he just, he had, he's like, you know me, if I see something I like, I, I just, over the top, will tell you about it. He gave such an, an amazing review of it without spoiling it, that I, I was kind of like, wow, this is, this is pretty cool. And my, uh, my wife was watching the review. Now, my wife loves horror movies, and... She, while while we're watching, she was kind of like, are you interested in seeing this? And I'm like, yeah, eventually. Well, while we're watching the Jason show, she bought tickets for it. And I was like, oh, I don't really want to see this. (laughs) When I got there, I mean, I was kind of like, okay, I just got to get myself in the mood. I got to get myself ready to be, you know, horror. I got to view it like a, like I'm on a on a roller coaster. I actually, and I gotta say, I uh, I liked it, and I recommend everybody see it. And I'm not gonna say anything about it because it's a movie you can only see once. You, it, it's it's uh, kind of like uh, what was the one uh, Unbroken with uh, Bruce Willis? Yeah. I mean, that's an old one, you know, and I found out about, unfortunately, somebody blabbed the secret to me before I saw it. And now it's like you watch and you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, everything's there. Or even even like uh, when when I told Corey, I never saw Citizen Kane because I knew Rosebud was a sled. And Corey, you know, hit me over the head and then bought me a copy of it. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm going to recommend it. I'm not going to say anything about it because it's one of those you have to see. You can only see once. I mean, you can see it again, but once you've seen it, you, the, when you go back to see it again, you're going to view it differently. And I actually sent Jason a notice and I told him, I said, you know, I like horror movies as much as you like cruise ships. He doesn't like cruise ships. And if you remember what happened in the news last couple of weeks about that, that ship off the course of Norway that lost power. And it was, it was like, I mean, people filming it going backwards and forwards and furniture and skylights falling. Oh, yeah. Anyways, I said, as my wife and I were watching your show, she was very interested in your review of the movie. I remarked that it sounded interesting. Next thing I know, she bought us tickets for tonight's show. If I'm up all night unable to sleep because you recommended this movie, I will be calling you Wednesday on your radio show and letting you know. Uh, I, and uh, so anyways, I just uh, I sent him a, a, a review that I, you could only talk with people who have seen the movie. So. I don't know if you're if you're game for it, Corey, but I do recommend seeing it. Uh, a couple of Kickstarters. I haven't really talked about Kickstarter because there's so much good stuff out there. I just I, I wouldn't even know where to start. But the first one I looked at was a backer created by Legion M, Girl with No Name. It's a one shot, forty page comic book. An orphan girl raised by her bounty hunter uncle sets out for revenge after he's murdered by a band of outlaws. Uh, it's a redhead with freckles and guns. I mean, you probably had me at the redhead thing. Um, their, their, their gist was basically, you know, it's almost impossible to get a movie made of an original story these days when the f- story is a female-led action, invest- action adventure set in the Old West. And so I guess uh, this is kind of the, uh, I guess they're just starting it as a, as a comic book. And if you go uh, look up a girl with girl with no name, it's already been pledged. I mean, it's 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 amazing. I mean, they they needed six thousand. They got eighty one thousand. So, and I just went in and I think I picked up. 
I, I was tempted. I was tempted to go for the hardcover, but then I kind of backed off and I just said, you know what, I'm going to go for a physical copy and uh, and then the uh, the enamel pin that they have. And they also have what they call founding fan status, which is an invitation to the development meetings. Uh, so when this shows up later, I will be talking about it, but it's still going. They've got through, uh, well, they got 17 days to go. So as of this podcast, it'll be 10 days to go. So uh, check it out. See if it's your cup of tea. Uh, I'm going to say her name. Corey, correct me if I'm wrong. Sora Sung? Yes. Oh, I got it right. How about that? I have no idea if she listens to the show. I've seen her artwork on the Facebooks. Absolutely beautiful. And she she just seems like she's uh, enjoying what she's doing. She's I'd love to meet her. I'd love to get her to one of the cons. She is on my short list of people that I would like to get a Supergirl sketch from. But she's working on an illustrated novel called Carnal Confessions. And you've got, let's see, oh, I was told there wasn't going to be math. There's still about around 20 days to go if you go look it up. Again, she needed 5,000. She's got almost 40. And I think it blew her away just how fast we were able to, to uh, support her. Tons of cool, unique collectibles available that uh, you can get. And again, you know, some of it starts as low as, you know, you get, you get a buck, you helped her out. Thank you. Uh, you can get a digital edition for as low as $10. I went for the hardcover. Uh, I believe it was around a $45 price point. And there's other ones too. What's really funny is some of the ones like they, I always love it when they say you can be in the, in the book. And those sold out almost immediately. You know, I mean, this is like in the $500 range, which is a little more expensive. Uh, they're looking to ship this in July. The, the previous book ships in uh, June as well. So just a couple of Kickstarters. And, you know, Corey and I are always open to Kickstarters. So if you got anything you're interested in, uh, just give us a yell and we will uh, promote it or check it out. Or hell, we might even buy it. Uh, speaking of books. I was wandering through Barnes & Noble, as I want to do, and they had me at the word Caddyshack. Chris Nash Awady wrote a book, The Making of a Hollywood Cinderella Story, and this book is just amazing. In case you didn't know it, Caddyshack is a 1980 American comedy film directed by Hal Ramis, written by Brian Doyle Murray, uh, Mr. Ramis, and Douglas Kenny. If you've ever seen Animal House, you've seen him. He's storage. What are we supposed to do, you moron? Corey, do you know the genesis of Caddyshack? Uh, yes, I do, because it's talked about a lot in the movie. Um, oh, what was that documentary they had about National Lampoon? This was uh, Doug Kinney's big plan after um, Animal oh. House. Oh. This was where he was going to show his comedy genius. And the big and, thing was, is they felt Ramus and Kenny felt kind of slighted because, you know, not only did Ramus want to be in the movie, but they also felt that as, as popular as Animal House was, they really got kind of side shafted for their involvement. You know, everybody was getting accolades and they weren't getting nothing. So they were given six million dollars and they basically held Ramus called it a six million dollar uh learning on how to direct or more importantly how not to direct because i mean it's just it's amazing the film was as amazing as it is i love it i absolutely love caddyshack matter of fact when i finished reading this book i had to watch caddyshack i may watch it now because i uh i going into it i'm just uh i, I just excited movie i mean if, i don't know how you kids out there are about 1980 80 uh uh comedies but to me caddyshack is is one of the best ones considering so much of it was improvised utterly amazing uh, but the only guy who didn't like improvising was ted knight and and uh that was kind of almost the downfall of the movie because they the when they finally got it together they just had hours and hours of everybody improvising and they it was just like a bunch of national lampoon skits that didn't really tie together except the fact they all had a golf theme. And Corey probably knows the answer. What did they figure out that they could do when they finally gave up and they brought in someone from the studio and said, we need to put this together into a movie? 
what was the 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 tying theme that put together all these these different uh sketches and things i honestly don't know because I'll give it you talks one... more about how the the stuff I've seen talked more about how Doug Kinney was just broken by the making of this movie. How yeah. when it was all done, he was like, "I why bother?" Yeah, yeah, and part of it was because of what I talked about when they they brought in someone from the studio to put this six million dollar mess back together. Uh, and of course, I can tell you, it was the nemesis of Bill Murray in the movie. Oh, the 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 gopher. Yep, and, and can, Kenny hated that fucking gopher. He did, and the you can see bits of it when you see the movie. Uh, if there's a scene where Rodney Dangerfield looks down and says, "Hey, that rodent stole my golf ball," and there's another one where when uh, Bill Murray's got the hose and he looks up and you see in the background the gopher is flapping around. In those two scenes, the gopher was a sock puppet. Once you see it, you cannot unsee it. Just like in the Amazing Spider-Man movie that Kristen Durnst was not holding on to Toy Me Require, he was, she was holding on to a Spider-Man dummy as they slowly pivoted the camera angle, making it look like she was flying. There, I ruined it for all of you. Because when you actually see the animatronics that they made as the gopher, he's almost as a beloved part of the movie as anybody else is. But that was the tying link. They thought this is what's going to tie together everything. They brought back some of the characters because Bill Murray was up in New York working uh, Saturday Night Live, and they tied it all together. Uh, just uh, it's a not only a fascinating thing about how they made the series, but also uh, uh, fortunately nothing with Caddyshack two in it, and uh, it also delves back into what I what I was teasing Corey about earlier the formation of National Lampoon Magazine, how Harold Ramis and Douglas Kenny got together, how they, they wove together with Chevy Chase and Bill Murray. And when Bill Murray showed up to film this, they didn't even know what they were going to do with him. It just brought him in. Because I think it was kind of like Brian said, hey, brother, you want a job? He goes, okay. And that was back when I think he even had his 800 number back then. Maybe we should call it his 800 number. So, hey, when you're in town, come on in on a podcast. <laughs> Couldn't hurt. But it, it's not only a great book for not only what, what Corey was alluding to, uh, but if you if you were a fan of the National Lampoon, if you enjoy the movie, and it's just amazing just how things kind of weave together and then it all comes to a head, and that's how Caddyshack was made. And uh, I enjoyed this. Uh, just it, it's one of those like a mid-sized paperback book. They run about seventeen bucks or so. And you know, there was one out on the Prince's Bride that I was gabbing about uh, a few back. So when you see these, they're, they're a lot of fun. And I hope they keep doing it with different movies. I would love to see one on Animal House. I would love to see one on on uh, almost any movie that, I, that I've enjoyed. I talked earlier about uh, the one graphic novel I read, X-Men Battle of the Atom. This was during the Michael Bendis years where they, they tied together all the books with uh, not only a bookend, Battle of the Atom 1 and 2. Then they took the three X-Men, or four X-Men books. All new X-Men, Uncanny X-Men, X-Men, just adjectiveless, and Wolverine and the X-Men. And uh, the gist of the story is the current X-Men meets some future X-Men who decide the X-Men from the past need to go home. Got it? Get it? Well, I got it for $1.99. So this was a very, very... Get it? Got it? Good. Yeah. And... Uh, I, I this will probably end up either on the eBay's or on the MSP Spring Con because I actually had the run segregated somewhere, and I don't know did they they have they done omnibuses on these yet or not? No, not okay, yet. good because that's how I, I want to collect the run because I did enjoy the run although it really he it didn't quite have the pizzazz as the Avenger run it did. Then again, if you end with Secret Wars, that was quite a pizzazz. Uh, the noise you heard in the background was my brand new phone. We got a deal on the Galaxy. I guess we're a second from the top. S10e. Ooh. So, yeah. I, the, I have the an old... S10 Plus. What is that? Is that the one behind me, or is that the one that has the three cameras in it? It's the one that has the three cameras. Oh, so Corey, Corey goes top of the line. See, kids, this boy just can't buy omnibuses. We actually looked at it, but for what we wanted, 
we decided to go with this. Uh, and what I'm finding out is, unlike with my old phone, I can actually put apps on this and leave them. I don't have to take them off. And unfortunately, I don't know what apps to put on because I've been avoiding apps because my I had a Galaxy 3. That's what a Luddite I was. They couldn't even get my information transferred over properly because it, it just was such an antique phone. And they don't even want it. It's sitting in a drawer somewhere. So if you want to, if you need a Samsung 3, let me know. And, and it's all yours. So uh, I'm, I'm enjoying this. Uh, I suppose I could put Marvel Unlimited on it, but the screen is so small. I don't know if it'd be worth it. Oh, what else do we got? Oh, I don't know if you watch uh, last week tonight with John Oliver, Corey. Yes. And I watched oh. the one last night. Yeah. He had a rant on WWE about, yeah, you almost got to see it. And it's not anything that we haven't said and, and guys from PWInsider.com have said just how for all the money that McMahon and company make on their wrestlers, they are independent contractors. Once they're out of the company, they're on their own. And, you know, the guys die. They get uh, concussions. Of, you know, again, it, it, not necessarily all of it's fair, but I got to admit WWE's response from it was really weak. I was able to view it on YouTube's, and it was just one of those things when I was I was tumbling through PW Insider, they mentioned it. So if you're a pro wrestling fan, and since this is WrestleMania week, and God knows WWE's going to make a ton of money, you might want to check this out. And, uh, and uh, I'm not going to say anything more about it because, uh, again, it's – it just came out, and you can go find it. A lot of fun. That's pretty much it. I'm I'm waiting uh, waiting for my box day. Corey and I were talking pre pre uh, show about the fact that I haven't got my previews yet. <laughs> I want to talk previews. Oh well, we'll figure it out. In the meantime, Corey, what are you geeking on? Uh, I really didn't have a lot of time this weekend, believe it or not, even though it was my, quote, weekend off, unquote. I had a lot of stuff to get done because I've got the upcoming surgery and uh, stuff piles up around the house when I'm working all the time. But I did spend Sunday afternoon with the Savage Sword of Conan Omnibus. This reprints uh, the early issues of Savage Tale when Conan was still in it, and then the first uh, few issues of the Savage Sword of Conan. Now, they can't reprint everything because they don't have the rights to certain characters anymore. But it does have all of the Conan stuff, including the Barry Windsor Smith stuff, including the John Buscema stuff, including some of the Gil Kane stuff. But as I'm going through, I remember, you know, when, when Conan, back in the 70s, everybody talked about how great the Barry Windsor Smith stuff was. And how nothing would ever be as good as that. And I have to tell you, man, I'm looking at this um, John Buscema work, inked by these Filipino inkers. Back in the 70s, it was printed on in newsprint. It wasn't terrible newsprint, but the paper was sort of uh, grayish yellow. And even when Dark Horse reprinted it, it was on pulpy paper. It wasn't on the best paper. This is the first time I've seen this stuff at pretty much near the original size it was supposed to be printed at. On the best paper possible with the best printing process as possible. Oh my God, this is beautiful. I mean, you see the individual ink lines. I, you can tell that a lot of these artists were like, this art is too good. I can't use Zipatone. They would just use individual lines on it to give it the depth and the texture that it needed. Um, John Buscema, when he wasn't drawing superheroes, was so grateful not to draw superheroes that he would put his heart and soul into his work. Um, there, I've read some John Buscema stuff from the late 70s and into the 80s where it's pretty damn clear he didn't give a shit. <laughs> it's okay, well, I got to draw these goddamn superhero fight scenes. But on this, he was putting his heart and soul into these pages. The, the poses and the anatomy that he used, it showed how he had learned all of this stuff from reading Brune Hogarth and Alex Raymond in his childhood. 
And just the level of detail he put into this was just, it, it, it really, I've always liked John Buscema, but seeing this art on this paper with this reproduction, it kind of kicked it up a level because it's just gorgeous. It's um, better than any reproduction I've seen of this these stories. And um, if you're at all a comic book art fan, these are this is a volume you've got to get because this was back when the magazines, um, a lot of the artists at Marvel were like, this is going to be a way to showcase my art rather than the shitty paper they're using with, you know, I'm getting paid for 16 pages and I have for a 17 page book. And, oh, it's just gorgeous. And um, that was the only thing I was geeking on all weekend. I was just in awe of how good this reproduction was and how amazing this art was. And um, so there we go. Believe it or not, kids, you've listened to us blather on about funny books for an hour and a half. Thank you. And as we say every week, the comic we like the least, we still like better than the comic that you like the most. Joe? <clears throat> a friend of mine from high school, he's a comic book collector, and he also uh, pops up in bands every so often, Michael Pescolini. He's uh, right now not doing anything music related, but he has been posting some of his old songs up on the uh, Facebook. And one of them uh, had a... Uh, I guess he's called the Creeper, and his uh, I, I, identity is, is Sean Sullivan. And I can say that because Sean fortunately passed away from diabetes complications a, a ways a uh, number of years ago. But And this is Mike's way of just remembering Sean. So without further ado, here is the Creeper. I'm on the roof with a gun. Uh, originally 2003 and now remastered for 2019. Bad words ahead. Corey, hit my music. The dogs on my window 